Hey folks, welcome back to another episode of the podcast. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, we are lucky enough to have found a new data friend to introduce. Randolph, thank you so much for joining us. Do you want to tell us a bit about yourself? Do I want to? That's such a loaded question, Jess. I it's will a very tell you philosophical about... podcast, that's why. Yes. Hi, my name is Randolph. Uh, my last name is made up and I am a South African living in Canada and I am a former child star. I'm, that's a joke. I'm a, <laughs> I'm a, I don't even remember what I do. I work for Microsoft doing something. I write documentation. <laughs> that was it. I am a senior content developer at Microsoft who works on SQL Server on Linux and SQL migrations. And sometimes I do installation and configuration content and an overall editor and uh, removing commas where they shouldn't be and adding them back somewhere else. And that's that's my professional side. And I, I used to be a, an actor and I was thinking about going into a full time and then this pandemic thing happened. So um, I guess Microsoft lucked out. Indeed. I mean, Microsoft documentation has a lot of things to do with acting and all that. While we're speaking about you removing commas, could you start removing all the Oxford commas for me? No, that is uh, something with which I agree strongly. Oxford commas are very useful for removing ambiguity. And one of the things that I might as well mention now, seeing as we're plugging the documentation, is to say that uh, we have 30 something languages that we have to translate into. And the Oxford comma makes it a lot easier for that to happen. So there's a good reason for it, as well as being my preference. Sorry for you. I mean, sorry. I'm so sad that we're already at the end of today's episode, but this was fast. <laughs> Did we even it make it feel like 15 minutes? minutes but I guess <laughs> <laughs> sometimes right time flies. Oh. I think there's been so many changes to the documentation recently, right? You've been pumping out new content and updated content. It's been well, lots of stuff happening. There's, there's lots of stuff happening. And of course, Microsoft Fabric was launched recently. So William, who's on my team as well, has been extraordinarily busy uh, working on that because that's under his, uh, whatever the word is. I'm a, I'm a professional writer. Can you tell? Um, auspices under his control, under his something. He's in charge of that. There you go. Perfect. And uh, yeah, I've been doing a lot of uh, quality control and consistency stuff so that everything kind of looks the same. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a good job. I enjoy the work. I miss consulting, but I don't miss the hours. I believe it. Cool. Well, I think it's my job to ask the first question. <laughs> <laughs> and to, uh, so first question is, what is your favorite data thing? So having received these questions in advance, which is a very useful thing, thank you for doing so. I spent long and hard thinking about it. And then as soon as you asked the question now, I forgot what I thought about. So I just wanted to tell you what kind of level I'm at, but I'm probably going to say temporal tables. And uh, the reason for that is because temporal tables are not perfect, but they do what they do very well. And they have re reduced the amount of custom auditing, auditing in air quotes, mm -hmm. that I've had to do for uh, remembering what the data used to look like at a certain point in time. So I think for what they are, they're, they're very effective. So it's one of my favorite features in SQL Server. In data general, I love internals. I love to know how stuff works. So um, I actually did a presentation two days ago on how SQL Server stores data types because it's one of my special interests. I have hmm. several special interests and those are two of them. Perfect. So if temporal tables for the reason of auditing, does that mean Ledger will become your new favorite feature at some point? So one of the things that that temporal tables don't do well is if you make a change to the to the main underlying table, it will change the temporal table if you have the right permissions without letting you know, it'll just do it. So it's not very good for forensic auditing, but if you want to keep track of what the data used to look like and you know that the table isn't changing, then it's good for that. Ledger doesn't allow you to do that and you need a lot more space for Ledger. Now, whether or not Microsoft is going to make any changes to it so that it can support uh, some sort of cleanup process, I cannot tell you even if I did know, but that would make it a more useful feature, but then you'd have to trade that off against, well, 
is this a real auditing feature? So Ledger is a great feature, but it does require a lot of disk space because it doesn't delete anything. So that's a that's a massive trade-off. So storage is cheap, but not that cheap if you have to store 10 years of data. Hmm. Like it never deletes anything ever? At this point in time, no. I cannot speak oh, for the future. Because, yeah. Hmm. And, and the re it's, it's a very good reason because if you're in some sort of manufacturing industry and somebody um, uh, starts a court case against you because you're product had some sort of uh, alleged flaw, then you can go back and say, well, here's our forensic uh, trail using the, uh, the, the, the ledger feature, and we can prove that every single insert into the database actually took place, and that's what the data should look like. So it has to keep it forever. That's just the mm -hmm. nature of the, of the feature. Interesting. Uh, and I mean, it, it does make perfect sense from exactly that purpose. Also, if you could simply add something to a ledger table and say, well, data expires after 10 years, or right. what, um, there's nothing that would stop me from just changing my server's clock. So there is probably way more thought that needs to go into that. Mm -hmm. That would stop me from that. Because, I mean, the yeah. whole idea of ledger is that I cannot just tamper with the data. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Now, th there's, a, there's a mutual acquaintance of ours who is an MVP who has proved that Ledger is not infallible, which which is fair. And his solution is just to drop the database and create a new one the way that you want it to look, which is, which is a very fair assessment of how to get around that kind of thing. But that's not how a lot of people think. And you'd need a lot more permissions to get that done. So if, if you're worried about your system DBA from uh, Getting into getting into sensitive data and changing sensitive data that's a different conversation to just regular users and you would have to set up your uh, defense in depth and make sure that all these kind of things are being tracked so it's not just one feature that's protecting you it's a it's all series of features well first of all that and second well second of all there's hopefully not that many people that actually have permissions to run drop database Correct. Again, says the person that just removed password complexity on a domain controller on a Friday afternoon, but potatoes. Party! You're all professionals here. And now it's on the public record, so congratulations, Ben. There's that. Damn it. Uh, we should not record these. We get into a lot of trouble by recording these there's conversations. That. This podcast would be so much better if you did not... Rec hang on. No. <laughs> Wait a minute. I'm, I'm sensing that would be, just be another flaw. We'll brainstorm um, that. However, my it's point not, was... Since there is no easy way of saying I drop that database, then I do whichever change I make in a new database, then I restore just part of the ledger, um, it would still leave a whole lot of traces. So yes, drop database oh, yes. would be a very easy way of really getting rid of all the traces, given that that's usually a very small amount of people that can, well, well given that it should be a very small amount of people, says the person that was just offered domain admin by a customer yesterday, wouldn't that be easier for you? Yeah, but yeah. I'm not 100% sure I'd want that. It would make things easier for today, but then in a couple of months, something goes wrong. Then you're going to wonder if I was the one that's responsible for that. The answer is probably still yes, but um, I want to do that in well, more shady ways. One of the one of the things we're, we're we're working on right now at in the database docs team is is temporary permissions to do uh, mergers and so on of the content and we're not even talking about products we're just talking about the content where you only do things when you need to so you have to go into a special screen and give yourself those permissions so that you can do the thing and then five minutes later there those those permissions are taken away so it's an intentional thing as opposed to accidentally clicking the big green button and Yes. Deleting 20 articles by accident. Which might be a pain on days where you're running tons of updates because like every five minutes you have to give yourself permission to that again. But right. From a but, quality but, assurance process, I would again lean towards saying that makes a lot of sense. A whole lot. Exactly. 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 But with GitHub, you can have like approvals and stuff, right? So the green button isn't so... I mean, I know if you have the permissions, you can still say do it anyway, but it doesn't, it's not a one click. So if you have all those gates and approvals and stuff in place. Jess, I'm going to say yes, but you'd be surprised at how easy it is to bypass if you know what you're doing and if you have the right privileges. Of course, this is all based on the premise that you have the right privileges, but right. every process that you put in place to protect people from a, a, an ex colleague of mine called them foot guns. So shooting yourself in the foot 
every step that you put in place to to prevent foot guns can be bypassed by somebody who is in a hurry and has the right permissions. And we're humans. So when that happens, because it does happen, then you need to go and figure out why that happened or how that happened and try and circumvent it again in future or or put some guardrails around it. That's just the, the nature of security. It's it's an ongoing trick. True, true. Fair. We got another question for you. So in times where you're not giving yourself permission to update Oxford commas, this is also one of the moments where I'm not sure if my sigh is really coming across through the noise gate and everything. So again, uh, that was better. Maybe um, you could put it in subtitles, sigh. I, I think we should totally do that. Um, also from an accessibility standpoint and everything. And again, sure. YouTube already does that for us if I'm doing it loud enough. But we're digressing again. This is for another episode. My question is, what's your favorite known data feature thing Hobby, activity. My favorite thing in the world is going on a cruise ship and going around and visiting places and not having to unpack my bag because it's all in one place and the hotel moves mm. with you. But my favorite thing to do that is not cruising is acting. I love acting. I've been acting on stage and on audio. I have a nice little microphone here that I'm speaking to you in since very young. I don't want to give away how old I am, 46, but I have uh, been acting for a very long time. You and heard it here, folks. <laughs> it's one of my favorite things to do. Uh, you do I, not look one day older than 45. I'm going thank to. Thank you. That's very kind of you to say. I am, um, I, I may have mentioned it in the beginning where because of the pandemic, I, my plans to leave IT completely and become a full time actor were laid waste, but I was hoping to get more into it because I have a very good agent who is very good at finding me work. And um, I had to tell her, sorry, but I'm not doing that in public and getting sick. And so I've been doing voice acting from home for radio commercials and little one-off things. It pays very well when I get those jobs. And I normally get in every one out of five, which is very good because normally when you audition, you get one out of every 10 or one out of every 20 gigs. So my agent is good. I get 20% of what I audition for. So if I just audition, then I'll get more jobs. And sometimes like I did two weeks ago, I was offered a voice acting job, which I turned down because it was for a media company in the U S that is right leaning. That's the nicest mm -hmm. thing I can say. So I looked them up and I said to my, my agent, a hard pass, I'm not doing this. They're not good people. And she said, who with me? I won't do political ads. I won't do stuff like that. So, so she's, she's very cool with, with my, my decisions because she knows I don't need the money. And it's not because of Microsoft. It's because I married a doctor. Cheers. Good thinking. Good thinking. However, um, <laughs> Unfortunately, there's people in in that um, sort of business that that do not get to make that choice. So, um... correct. I'm I'm being facetious, but there's a there's a strike on in the U.S. right now with the Professional Actors Union because uh, they're they're worried about and rightfully so they're worried about artificial intelligence. They're worried about streaming rights because all the streaming services are private companies that are in the IT space. That's how they're getting around paying out their royalties. When I did an episode of net network television in I think it was 2017. I was on camera for three minutes. I had one day before that I got done up for the, the outfit that I was wearing. It's called costuming. And in total, I was paid about $2,000 for those two days. And I still got a residual check. Look, it took five years to get that residual check, but I got a, a residual check for $75. That $75 that I got for being on camera for three minutes is higher than people on Orange is the New Black are getting as their residual checks. So network television pays a lot more than streaming does. Wow. And that's one of the complaints that these folks have because they are full-time professional actors and they cannot even afford healthcare because they're not making $28,000 a year, which is the minimum that they need for healthcare. So wow. there's a very good reason that they're striking. And um, I'm glad the Writers Guild of America got the things that they were looking for. And 
as a Microsoft employee, I'm going to provision this by saying, I know Microsoft is very heavily into AI and all of that thing. And so I have no opinion about Microsoft's position on AI, but I do know that the Writers Guild of America got a very good deal when it comes to AI generative stories and stuff like that. If you do use AI, you have to say that you're using it, which is good. And you cannot use it to produce scripts without people knowing. And if people say you're not allowed to use it, then you're not allowed to use it. So I think that's a good deal from their side. And the uh, on the actor's side, they're hoping that you don't use uh, digital images or basically electronic copies of your, your features and so on. So that uh, if you're, for example, a background actor, also known as an extra, you... Background acting is incredibly difficult because you have to pretend that you're a normal person doing normal things and whatever's happening in the foreground is of no interest to you unless the director says, okay, now look. That's hard to do because you always want to look at the camera and you always want to watch these, these famous people walking around and doing their thing. And they're worried that background acti- actors will be taken away and replaced with digital doubles because it's cheaper. Now, mm. whether or not that's true... It's not my place to say because I'm not in that industry in terms of creating digital doubles, but I do know that an actor's union is a very important thing because I belong to one. And yes, I'm biased, but they do look after us. So that's my little rant over. Cheers. Jess, I've got an idea. What's the idea? I mean, usually that would kind of be the point where we kidnap uh, lure Randolph into our van. Yes. Whatever. They like going on cruises. So you think we should just join on a a cruise? I mean, for like a week or so. I don't know how I feel about cruises. I've never been on a cruise, so I figured we we might just give it a try. We'll have to learn. We'll give it a go. For you. you. Literally widen our horizon there. Yeah, true. And you you can do the small boats that are on the rivers, or you can do Mm -hmm. the big ships. You don't have to go on a. You don't have to go on a party boat, but you can. Just wash your hands. Yeah. I, th- <laughs> I think the small river boat would be a good entryway, a good gateway, yeah. maybe. Well, when you're off cruising, is there a favorite food that you like to eat while cruising that we should pay, maybe partake in? This is how you're going to convince us. This will also define where we're going for that cruise, probably. True, true. Here's the problem with going on a cruise. The main dining room has most of the foods that you would enjoy, and there's no limit to the number of meals you, that you can have. And they, yes, they judge you, but they don't do it to your face. So if you say, I cannot decide between the macaroni cheese and the filet mignon, they will say, well, why not both? And then you'll get both. And then for dessert, you say, I cannot decide between the sorbet or the fancy whatever, I cannot think of anything right now, which is great. I'm, I'm a great, great guest. You're welcome. Meringue, let's say, or baked Alaska. And then you say, well, I, I cannot decide. And they'll say, well, why don't you have the base baked Alaska with sorbet? And then you progressively get bigger and bigger and bigger, and then you never leave the ship, which I think is their intention. But it's still one of my favorite things to do because the hotel moves with you and you can walk around, you can visit new places, you can get off the ship at certain ports and wander around and sometimes escape the enclosure like we did in Haiti and see some very interesting things and then get a security detail. That was exciting. Whoops. That was a very elegant way of avoiding the question of your favorite gonna, food, but I was gonna say, we'll get back it, to it still. Mac and in cheese. In summary, your favorite food is food. Oh, I can totally <laughs> roll with mac and cheese. Oh, I love that mac and cheese. And spaghetti Great bolognese. Choice. Yeah, I could eat that too. We'll go with mac and cheese. Someone else has already said spag bowl. Well, plus also mac and cheese is vegetarian, so it's ah, something for Ben here. That's true. Here, well, so. cheese, nice yes. Inclusive. Yes. Yes. I mean, we can have different sorts of mac and cheese. We can have some that have bacon on it or whatever, but so it doesn't Maybe have some to be hot like dogs plain mac and cheese it. for everybody. Uh, we yeah. can just get a selection of mac and cheese because in that case, we're not going to get the filet mignon. We're just going to get like a mac and cheese sampler, but instead of small sampling portions, we're going to get like a sampler with a bunch of proper portions. This will be amazing. Perfect. I support this. I support this endeavor. Great. Most excellent. All right, folks. I got to go packing because apparently we're going on a mac and cheese cruise. Amazing. Randolph, it was a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. I, I miss you 
in person and this is the next best thing so Likewise. thank you for thank you for doing this agreed we should still make plans on getting back together in person but oh, that was a good intermediate solution i'm going to say so again sure. thank you thank you everyone for watching thank you jess and we see you all next week bye bye